four, three, two, one. <laughs> and we are live again. Welcome once again to Live Stream Stories. Today, we have a special guest calling in all the way from New York City, Ariel Vieira, who is a filmmaker and a live stream videographer. And he does this really cool thing. And I'm going to let him introduce himself. I have this video queued up that is a video that he made. And he basically takes people on walking tours of any city that he happens to be in. And so let me cue this up and have him tell you what he does. <laughs> so just a second here. Going to turn this on. So we're up in Jackson Heights, Queens, along the 7 train. I remember looking at views of the downtown Manhattan skyline with wonder. And then three years ago, I started my biggest endeavor yet, Urbanist. It's a Facebook Live show where I take over 41,000 viewers to every single corner of New York City. I'm Ariel Vieira. I'm a filmmaker and storyteller. I've been living in New York City my entire life. It's in my blood, and I know it like the back of my hand. Let me show you. And here's our first stop. Follow me. The Mysterious Bookshop. Here you'll find everything about crime, mystery, and espionage. The oldest fence in all of New York City. Originally, the fence had British crowns on top, but in 1776, American revolutionaries came and sawed them off. And according to legend, they smelted them into cannonballs and shot them at British ships. Inside the historic 30 Water Street is one of the best bars in the entire world. Let's go. At least they won all of these accolades. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Great clip. Right. So welcome to the show, Ariel. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me here. Yeah, it's really great. Um, so I just, you know, by way of getting started here, um, I would really like to hear you explain, like, you are, your background is as a filmmaker. And somewhere in the much more recent past, you decided to start doing live streaming and to, to basically create this ongoing production, this ongoing regular series where you're walking people through different parts of New York City and different parts of other cities that you visit. And how did you make that choice? Like, how did you decide, first of all, to move to the live video as a medium? So actually my start with filmmaking coincided with my start with live video. I've always wanted to be a filmmaker, but I, I delayed a long part of my life uh, as I worked in tech and media. And then I decided to start vlogging back in 2016, being inspired by creators like Casey Neistat. While at that same time, I was a social video manager in Vox Media, taking care of their social video distribution. And that's Vox with the V-O-X, not the F. Um, and I, what happened exactly that year was that Facebook started paying major media companies to do live video. And the vertical I was working with in Vox was Curbed, which was about real estate, cities, architecture, and design. And they didn't have any video team on hand. So I volunteered since I already had community management experience and also a social video experience. I just decided to say, hey, we could do both at the same time. We could build a community. <laughs> And we could do social video on live video. And that's uh, the very inception of the walking tours uh, because live video seems so attractive, not only because uh, Facebook was giving the big bucks to these media companies, but uh, beyond that, for me personally, vlogging was a bit uh, tedious because I was staring into a big camera lens alone in public. It just felt so weird. But the moment I went live, I saw the little hearts, the little thumbs up, <laughs> the comments of like, ooh, oh, cool, that's a park, or oh, look at that bench, or ooh, that seems like a good coffee shop. I just felt like, wow, I can make videos and have people join me at the same time, and I don't need to edit. It just felt like the greatest thing ever. And that's <laughs> what got me hooked on live video initially. Oh, that's um, great. Yeah, so in just you're talking about that, like as people are coming on when you're live, I mean, and you're on a tour of a particular place, how much of what you choose to do is directed by people who are watching? Like if they go, oh, that's a cool bar, or oh, look at that gallery. Do you follow those cues? See, that's a great question. I think that gets to the very heart of what makes live video better or different from a vlog or a TV show. So, 
they are you can do a live video where it's uh very meticulously planned uh which i've done before which are, which is a set tour with the cinema stops with the set uh with the kind of a script or, or very extensive notes and that's it i'm done 40 minutes that's it but i don't like doing those type of live videos too much i find live videos to be more engaging when they can run a little bit longer because there's some input from the audience and sometimes the audience asks hey can we see that little thing one block away and i'm like sure or they ask me hey can you zoom in on the say the rooftop of this church and that's i think what makes live video powerful that it's not a merely just me the host doing a show but the audience is basically the filmmakers the the producers as well they're also the storytellers because they tell me their own stories about the places we explore yeah that's cool so okay well let, let's just describe like when you're out and about yeah what are like how elaborate is your setup like what are you actually using to go live with <laughs> that's a great question uh, <laughs> a lot of people always think like i have some super crazy elaborate setup uh, right and we're not talking like you're you like you're gary v and you have this entourage of videographers who follow you wherever you go <laughs> precisely yeah yeah uh, people always have the assumption that i'm a huge media company and i do that on, <laughs> i do that kind of on purpose i, I have the brand name and everything but I do three types of setups. The one I do 95% of the time is my iPhone with my D, uh, with my gimbal, which is D DJI Osmo Mobile, and I have a wireless mic just so to have extra good audio. And yeah. that's it. That's that, that that's the entire setup. I use uh, right now Prism Live Studio, and they have access to Restream, so I'm able to stream both to Facebook and YouTube, which is awesome. Oh, wow, um, yeah. And, and then the other two set, setups I do is a DSLR camera. I have partnered up with Live View, and I've done DSLR. Basically, it's just carrying a huge either a tripod or on uh, the huge gimbal and walking around with DSLR. But that's a much more heavier setup. And also, it's not so easy to do it when it's walking. But if it's like a, a live concert, then I'll maybe do a DSLR. Mm -hmm. And my third setup is uh, 360 live video. Oh, it, nice. It used to be a little bit easier with uh, the older 360 cameras that Insta360 used to do. But for some reason, they're putting less emphasis on live streaming for some reason. So I haven't done so much li 360 live streaming in the past like year. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So when you like, you're now, I have never used Prism. So is Prism a mobile app? Is that how it works? How does it hook up with your phone? Yeah, so Prism Live Studio is now a mobile app. And it has all the basically all the main functionalities of Wirecast is okay. now in the app. So I'm able to have video, which could be picture in picture or full screen. I could do oh. photos. I could do music. And I could do text that's both dynamic or just static text. And I could do multiple streams at the same time. Cool, right? So, and that's through Restream. Now, I'm just going to pause for a second and acknowledge Restream, <laughs> because first of all, Restream is responsible for the show. They're the sponsor of this show, and they happen to be my current one of my current favorite tools to use. And it's because of just what you're talking about. When you're using Restream, you don't have to limit yourself to just one destination. They have actually up to 30 different choices of places that you could be streaming to simultaneously. <laughs> so like, for instance, this show right now, this stream is going live to Facebook, and it's going live to LinkedIn, and it's going live to YouTube, and it's going live to Twitter. And even within that, you know, on Facebook, we're going live to my profile page, my business page, my group page, Restreams page, you know, et cetera. Like, if whatever page you have access to, you can be streaming to all those locations. So, if you have a private group and you want to stream right into them, they're really good. And this is this is really interesting because it's the first time I've really heard about how simple it is to multicast from a mobile phone. And this just seems like a tremendous tremendous advantage of of doing this kind of live presentation. 
It really is. Yeah. And it yeah. Uh, led to exponential growth on YouTube, for example, for me. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and let's just segue into that. Like, how have you, and you've actually acquired a really nice following. And how did that happen? Like, what was the time frame? And, you know, how did you, how, what are the things that you've been doing to attract new people to the streams that you're creating? So I've been running Urbanist for a little bit over four years now. And uh, for those four, first four years, I've been exclusively on Facebook. And just the past few months, I've been doing YouTube as well. Uh, so remind me of your question again. <laughs> well, the question is simply just what are you doing to oh, achieve oh. audience growth? Like, there's got to be like when you were starting, we all start from zero, right? <laughs> exactly. So, How did I grow initially? And so we're we're going yeah. like I can, I'll go live on Facebook, yeah. and and maybe if I'm on Restream, I'll go Facebook and YouTube together. And in the beginning, you know, I'm talking to a very small audience, and you now have you know over ten thousand some people following you on Facebook, you know, and then more on YouTube. So you've got a pretty good following going. And I'm just wondering, like, how did that happen? Where did those people come from? How did they find yeah. you? So to me, live streaming is like the theater. Theater sucks when there's only two people in the audience. <laughs> it sucks for the actors. It sure it, does. <laughs> it sucks for the audience as well. So right. uh, it, it's, it's also a live streamer's job to find their audience. And on Facebook, that doesn't happen organically via um, dis discoverability like YouTube. YouTube, uh, a video will pop up because people are searching for New York. But on Facebook, there's no real discovering videos. So the way to I got my videos out was to coordinating shares with major Facebook groups and major Facebook pages. Oh, so, yeah. In the very beginning of Urbanist, I collaborated with companies like Atlas Obscura, City Lab, which is part of the Atlantic, and uh, New York.com was another major one. And these companies had upwards of 300,000 followers on their pages. So mm -hmm. they would share my live video while I'm live. Wow. So I had not only access to my audience, I had access to theirs. Right. It was kind of crazy to think about. And it was a very good hack to grow very quickly on Facebook. And it, the the proposal of that I basically gave to all of them is like, hey, I'm sure your followers would love to learn about the history of New York and so so place. Uh, would you care to share? And usually they would. Uh, a, because I was branded as a show, not branded as like Ariel Vieira's travel vlog. Uh, so they were more comfortable with sharing from another media brand. And then B, uh, more con for these media brands, the more content, the better, especially on Facebook. So they also get all that sweet engagement on their page and sweet reach on their page mm -hmm. without doing any work. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's why that proposal worked very well in the beginning. And then after a while, it was a little bit harder to share with major pages and groups because... Facebook, uh, I think, received a little bit less attention from major media groups, especially in the live video space. So I just grew more organically. I just yeah. uh, continue sharing it with major Facebook groups. That was the big kicker, the Facebook groups. And now they're even becoming even bigger now. So I focus on sharing with big groups that are relevant to the live video, either while live, and I have a few people helping me with that, mm -hmm. or I do it myself after the live video. And the people who say, like, who see me, who see that share end up saying, hey, I want to actually see this while it's live. And then they end up tuning in to my scheduled time. That's great. That, that's how I grew quickly on Facebook. But YouTube is interesting. So now on Facebook, I have about 48,000 followers. Wow, that's um, great. Congratulations. Thank you, thank you. It, it's now it's growing bigger. So some something happened with Facebook in the past few months that they're now incentivizing live video. And I think all of us know what, what happened. Unfortunately, the pandemic has has shocked the world, but in terms of the live video space, has brought a lot of attention to live video. Um, but YouTube is now paying attention to live video as well. Yep. The cool thing about YouTube is I have to do zero work with mm. it when it comes to sharing or distribution because that's a platform where there's discoverability. 
So people are searching search terms. Mm -hmm. The only thing I need to think about is A, having a steady schedule, which gets people keep tuning in, and B, is having a search term that people are searching. So in my case, it's New York City Live. That's right. the basic search term. Right. Or whatever, Times Square, or if I'm in Boston, Boston so-and-so. And that ha I now have people randomly bump bumping into my show while I'm live, even to a hilarious extent where I had a few comments from people saying, I was watching Minecraft videos, and suddenly <laughs> I popped in, this video popped up, and they're, they, they're so confused as to why, but they end up getting hooked anyway. So that's why YouTube, I've been able to grow from about 4,000 subscribers before I started live video yeah. to now 17,000 subscribers. So wow, that's really good. A growth of 13,000 subs in only about two months. Wow, that's great. Yeah. That's really great. So have you experimented at all with um, getting together with, like in the way that you've done it with you know large groups on Facebook, have you had people you know, like, you go to a neighborhood and there's some local person who is well known in that neighborhood and you and you do something with them as a way to uh, get more exposure to your videos. Yeah, that was my early strategy when I first started Urbanist. So I would collaborate with not just the pages, but also like major museums and major um, festivals. And they would share my live video whenever I would cover their place. Oh, yeah. And that, would, that was a great way of getting access to their audience as well. And I still do that from time to time. But since uh, we are amidst a global pandemic, most locations are still closed. So that has not been so feasible. Yeah, right. Of course. <laughs> right. OK, so well, this is all cool. Like, And when you're doing live streaming, like you're out there, first of all, you're on your own. It's just you and your phone. You know. And you're and you're moving like you have this movement thing going. What are the what are the challenges that you've run into in trying to you know have it like an ongoing like you're doing this thing, and it's just you, and it's a live stream. Yeah, I mean the challenges are are immense because uh, as you mentioned, I, I'm walking, talking, doing cinematography because I uh, put a lot of importance in how I move the camera. Mm -hmm. I believe you can tell a lot of story just by movement. Right. And then beyond that, I'm also adding text, photos, sometimes videos, and interacting with the audience and having a conversation, and sometimes telling a greater story about a neighborhood or a piece of architecture while tying it as a conversation piece. So, <laughs> <laughs> and then. Right. <laughs> and then dodging traffic as well. So well, yeah, right. Not getting hit by a bus. <laughs> uh, so it's quite a lot. A anything can go wrong, and I think that's that's why people like tuning in. Not yeah. necessarily because things go wrong or they want to be a voyeurs to something negative. Mm -hmm. but I think it's that excitement that you're there with someone in real life, and there, there's not a, a super produced show like television, which something can be edited out. Right. right. Um, so how do I contend with all these challenges? One of the challenges that I think is the most central to live video is the liveness of the video. So right here, this type of format is an exception because we're having a conversation. Uh, this is an interview. So yeah. I also do interviews, and I basically do this format. But when you are doing a live video where it's one person focusing on the live video, then it turns into a conversation. I think that's the beautiful thing about live video. So it's not a lecture, it's not a speech, and it's not a a um, a speaking gig as someone might do in a conference. Live video is a conversation. So you're having a conversation with 10 people, 100 people, sometimes in my case, 1,000 people at the same time. That is challenging because it's both a one-to-one. -one. Mm -hmm. So I am saying hello to Barbara from Minnesota. Right. And it's also a one-to-many because I'm also telling a story about Times Square to Barbara and a 1,000 other people. 
that I think requires a flexibility in how to tell a story and how to present a tour or any type of thing that happens, maybe a conversation, maybe a museum walkthrough, maybe a, a, a food eating uh, experience. And that requires to have a, a looseness so you can't strictly script and you can't strictly have a plan. You have to be more willing to go with the flow of what whatever could happen and whatever mm -hmm. people ask. Right. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about um, your technique in storytelling. You know, you're basically this mobile cinematographer and what are and you're developing a style of what is basically a new form of cinematography. And so what are what are you discovering <laughs> as you're doing this? <laughs> Great question. So for me, I'm very Filmmaking is number one for me. I'm not, uh, I'm a tour guide, maybe third place. It's filmmaking, live streaming, and then tour guide for third place. Right, so for me, I focus a lot on the movement. I think you can convey emotion through motion. So on live streaming, there are certain cinematographic uh, techniques that you can use to enhance the story. And I found a few different shots that really work well on live streaming. For one, I call it the wow shot. So whenever I look at a piece of architecture, I try to move the camera the way I would look up and look around and be like, wow, this is amazing. So <laughs> the, the reason I call the wow shot is because every time I to do that time, type of pan up, if I do a pan up that feels more naturalistic because I'm basically following my eye movement. I see that wow face pop up on Facebook. So <laughs> that's why I end up calling it the, the wow shot. The other, funny. <laughs> the other shot that really, really works well and is engaging is called what I call the friend shot. So mm -hmm. think about this in TV, whenever a host is speaking, maybe Anthony Bourdain, may he rest in peace or, or anyone else who uh, Josh Gates on, on Discovery Channel. Usually they do this type of shot where it's a walk and talk. So the right. guy's walking towards the camera and the camera might be walking back yeah. at the same time if yeah. it's if it's that extensive. Um, and they do that same thing if, if say, Josh Gates is talking to his uh, interview subject. But that works for TV because TV, it's a one to many. French shot is I put the camera right next to me as if the person is literally walking right next to me or sitting next to me. And that feels like you're there with the person. You're mm -hmm. equal to the host. Mm -hmm. You're not a viewer of the show. You're, you are the show. Yeah. Uh, and those are two different types of camera techniques I do. The, the third most basic one, I think, is don't be afraid to move the camera um, dynamically because... Television show, the reasons the camera doesn't move dynamically is because it's a massive setup. So right. you can't really do a, a wow shot that easily with a gigantic red dragon camera that a television show might use. Right. Um, and you can't do a French shot. It's very hard to do, especially with those type of cameras. And then beyond that, if you're doing a YouTube vlog, it, it just might not fit because you know YouTube vlog, you want a little bit more ortho, ortho, authoritativeness in your cine, in your cinematic language. So, for example, in one of the shots I do, and I've actually copied a lot from major vloggers as well, like Casey Neistat, and there's a few others that do very excellent types of shots that work well with live streaming. So one <laughs> of the other one I do is. For example, I want to let in people on the secret and I move the camera close to me. I can't do right. it right now because I have a DSLR, but I move the camera <laughs> close to me. <laughs> right. And that, that makes you, it, 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 you treat the camera as if it were the viewer. Yep. So the viewer almost has that subconscious perception of saying like, oh, you're actually telling me a real secret, uh, which is hard to replicate on the television set. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, that's so. That's really cool. That's so interesting. Yeah, and I mean, you can be basically, you know, a human crane. I mean, it's you, the phone, a gimbal. You can do really super low. You can do close up. You can 
you know, zoom with your feet. <laughs> yeah. You can you can do all kinds of stuff. You know, you have complete freedom within the range of how far you can reach with your arm. <laughs> Precisely. And, and another technique you just mentioned about the feet, uh, mm -hmm. another technique I use that's brought, borrowed from vloggers is doing those small shots of showing me walking, you know, just like a, a second of my feet. Or, sure. or what I do a lot is touching walls. I'm a very uh, kinetic person. I really like uh, touching things <laughs> like, right. uh, like, like architecture. But right. even doing that just on a, with the camera, it's just that kind of like, if you see someone touching something, it feels like you are touching it. Mm -hmm. And if you see a, sh a, boot, a shot of the feet, it's, it's an angle that usually doesn't really matter too much. But if you see it for a quick second, you feel like you're there walking with the person as well. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> that's so great. Well, I mean, a lot of things you can do is, you know, anything you're doing that's creating, you know, an emotional experience, a tactile experience, a very visual experience, you know, our brains are wired so that we can't, you know, we can't tell the difference between watching this thing and it feels like, we're, if it feels like we're there, we have that feeling. We get that really visceral experience that whatever it is that you're getting, we're going to get it too which is why it works so well. That's so Precisely. Great. It's almost, live streaming is almost like a first person shooter game. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or like a Grand Theft Auto, you know, those those video games where you get into the perspective of the person. Right. Um, it's yeah, well, that's so cool. Like you're, actually, that is very much yeah. what you're doing. And it's a first person shooter from the form that you're shooting video <laughs> <laughs> yeah. rather than shooting virtual whatevers. And, yeah. And people are right there with you. Like it's a first person perspective following you along. That's so good. That's so great. Yeah, I love that. So just in terms of the stories that you are creating and the stories that you're telling, do you, is each episode a standalone or have you created a series of things? Or like, I know you were here in Boston recently, which by the way, this is where I live. And so you come to Boston, did you do like, Okay, I'm in Boston, and here's the series. And join me tomorrow because I'm going to go do this other thing. How do you how do you wrap these episodes together? Yeah, great question. So I've done a few series. Boston, I did not do it as a series, um, just because I wanted to be a little bit more loose in Boston. But I've done, for example, when I went to Rome, I did a specific twelve episode series called "The Mysteries of the Eternal City." Okay. So. Each episode, I basically left as a cliffhanger to the next one and try to focus on the storytelling in a way where either the last stop related to the next um, place where we're going to visit in the next episode. And another series I did was called Hidden History, where I tried to kind of connect stories uh, throughout the 14 episodes I did. And it just uh, it was an easy way to say, uh, remember, like in episode one, we talked about this uh, obelisk. Uh, so actually, this obelisk was related to this museum now in episode five. That was a, uh, it was interesting to do that. It doesn't work too well, unfortunately, I think, on live video because since, so one interesting aspect about live video is you could do either two types of live video. You could do a live video that's very tight uh, and it feels like a television show. Mm -hmm. So a limited amount of time. And usually in order to feel a tight live video, I think you have to go either 45 minutes or under. So anywhere between 20 to 45 minutes, I think ends up feeling like a very nice uh, specific intentional experience. That. The thing with when that happens is you don't have flexibility in other ways. You can't you can't decide to go in a different direction, or you can't decide to tell a, a interesting story that might have a be a really fun tangent, or have a, a spontaneous cup of coffee on live video and talk about coffee. Right. I, that's one type of live video. The second type of live video I think is is the one I like doing the most is is longer form. So the longer the better, and. They could be, I usually I do with them about an hour to two hours, but sometimes they could go even longer. And you're there just to tune in. So with the first type, people usually see the full thing. They're there for the entire 45 minutes. Um, 
my my previous shows on Rome is a good example of that. Uh, another live streamer who does that is his name is French Fry in Paris on YouTube, <laughs> and he's a tour guide. And the videos he does is a tour, yeah, it's virtual, yeah. But for me, when I end up going longer than forty five minutes, I know I cannot expect people to watch the entire thing. Sure. Uh, so live streaming ends up becoming more like a, a house party where people drop in and drop out. You know, they come in for a few minutes, might say hi, might want to listen to the segment about the obelisk and then go on their merry way. Mm -hmm. I, I will always have a percentage of followers that will be so hardcore that they'll watch my four hour live stream. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, that said, since People are dropping in and out. I think a series does not work with that format too well. So if I end up having episodes that are longer than 45 minutes, uh, I cannot expect a series to work because no one will probably, there's a, be a very small percentage of people who will watch the entire two hour live stream because mm -hmm. after it's live, two hours feels like an eternity <laughs> when you're searching on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. I, I do not. I personally don't watch live stream replays because they just seem too long to me. Right. Live is best, especially that second type of live video, it's longer. Live is best when it's live. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, so I yeah, so fascinating. Um, I'm wondering where do you see this going? You know, like I sort of have a two-part question here. One is I'm curious to know like what results ha have you seen from doing this? Like what's been happening to you because of the, of what you're doing like you know because of because of my live stream series this this happened what's the answer to that question well because of my live stream series i've become a very uh a very good storyteller that can be very spontaneous and doesn't need to rely on the script uh so for me professionally uh, I've become a better storyteller and filmmaker for that and writer mm -hmm. as well, because I'm able to uh, talk about things spontaneously. And that has a certain magic to it, has a certain spice, certain kick. But I think in terms of uh, as live streaming, not much happened in the first four years, to be honest, because people didn't quite know what live video was. Right. It was hard to ex to explain to most people and whenever I would, uh, when I would approach tourism boards or major brands, the majority of them would be saying, "Okay, yeah, we, we can maybe do live video, but how big is your Instagram? <laughs> about <a> photo, <laughs> uh, or right. or can you make us a vlog?" Um, but now, since there's a lot more, um, the spotlight's more on live video. I think um, now people are starting to realize that live video has a huge potential for gaining an audience that is extremely loyal and gets hooked for much longer periods of time mm -hmm. than any Netflix show or any TikTok se session or any vlog. Right. Because when you're there live, you might not realize that you were watching a four hour live and then four hours pass by and you're like, God damn, I just watched this guy for four <laughs> hours. He was eating for about 30 minutes of those four hours. And I just sit, sat there <laughs> and talking about the history of avocado toast. <laughs> that is going to have an extremely massive impact on what type of business one can do in terms of sponsorships and integrations. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, integration is nice on the vlog that could, you know, 10 million people can watch, but people could skip over that one minute, 30 second integration on the vlog, which I usually do admittedly. Mm -hmm. um, but on live stream, you're there invested with the person. People like what you're doing. People want to listen to you. They want to keep on tuning in. They want to keep on watching that entire live session. So if I have an integration of, say, I visit a Shake Shack and I'm sponsored by Shake Shack. There, even though the audience might be in the tens of thousands, but not in the millions like a vlogger, that tens of thousands of audience will more likely be.
be buying into that product. Sure. Yeah, and they're way more engaged. Video. Yeah. Yeah, and, that's, that's really interesting. And uh, beyond that, live video has uh, enabled me to uh, branch out also to doing live streaming in terms of uh, as a freelance filmmaker. So there's a lot more conference or right before the pandemic, there was a lot more conferences and more speaking gigs and more uh, virtual performances that were popping up. Yeah, that's great. That's cool. All right. So what do you think? I mean, given the context that we're now in the world of social distancing and traveling and conferences are not a thing of the present, although they're bound to be a thing of the future. Yeah. Uh, what, do you, what are you looking at? Like, what's your coming season look like? <laughs> are uh, you like, I'm in New York City, so I've been, you, I mean, you're, you have this huge advantage. You're yeah. in New York City, so yeah. anywhere you turn, there's something interesting to do. You know, that's cool. But I'm just sort of curious as like, well, what do you, like you've had to do a certain amount of shifting given what's been happening in the last six months, both with things are shutting down. So some opportunities aren't there, but on the other hand, there's so much more interest in live video that the other things are coming your way. So what does is, what is your landscape look like right now? I've already done a thousand live videos in New York and over 2000 live videos in general. And, um, I was looking forward to traveling and doing live videos in, in Europe specifically. I'm not sure when that's going to happen. So since I am stuck in New York and especially with the pandemic now rising again, it, traveling to nearby cities seems a little bit more tedious. So I've been doing something new or not new, but I've been, um, in, getting better at doing the type of show which i call a wandering so rather than literally having like no plan whatsoever no agenda just wandering through new york city and somehow telling a story or somehow bumping into interesting encounters uh, with people with outdoor musicians with a, a cafe and that has been very exciting because I'm only human. So I, I've gotten bored of telling the same history stories. And sure. I'm, I've gotten bored of exploring the same neighborhoods. Uh, so with wanderings is I am there for two hours. Who knows what could happen? The, the, <laughs> inter the interesting thing about that is I'm more comfortable with it because a I know already a lot about New York City, so I can I can still add value in terms of stories, in terms of history, anecdotes, in terms of practical information. But beyond that, it's a great challenge to be a storyteller that is not required to have any type of uh, knowledge or story. You know, it's it's truly being an entertainer in the purest sense, uh, like a a, a part a host of a party. You know, you not, might not know everyone. You might not know every single story. You might not plan everything ahead of time, but you you have to be there. You have to be fully present. So you have to just show up. So I'm I'm practicing or I'm getting very good at showing up, being fully present with my audience and having an adventure. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. I mean, I could imagine a version of sort of a live version of Humans 2.0 <laughs> or something along that nature or a live version of, you know, Hearts unknown, <laughs> where you know, like just whatever you're experiencing, that's what you get to experience, and this is what we're doing. This is what we're doing right now. <laughs> precisely, precisely. The the it's a lot easier with New York City being than Kansas. Uh, uh, of course, it's, it might be a little bit more challenging in a smaller city where there's not much going on, but uh, it is a. a is uniquely perfect for live video because you can't really meander uh, through a city for two hours on any other medium. It just does not work. It works if you write a book like uh, Hemingway did or or, or Anthony <laughs> Bourdain, but you have to collect those all those experiences and then you deliver it as a book. Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay, so people wanting to hook up with your ongoing stuff, going to urbanist.live, is that the best way to find you? Uh, the best way to find me is directly on the social media. So YouTube, Urbanist Exploring Cities, and Facebook okay. is Urbanist Live. And I go right. live every 1 p.m. Saturday and Wednesdays. All right. Two times a week. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and roughly like when you're live, if I'm tuning into a Saturday live, this is like a two hour experience? Yeah, for my scheduled ones, I try to keep it around two hours maximum. Okay. Uh, then I do other spontaneous ones that could, could run much longer. <laughs> That's so great. I love it. I just love it. Yeah. <laughs> well, someday, someday, this is my wish. I'm going to come down and I want to be with you. I want to join you while oh, you're yeah. live. That would be so much fun. Oh, <laughs> 100%. Let's do it. <laughs> it's so great. Next time, I don't know. Like, well, I don't know when I'm coming to New York again, but whenever it's possible, we'll figure that out and make it happen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No plan. No plan whatsoever. No script. We'll do it. Oh. We'll do a live. <laughs> okay. okay, I love it. Okay, okay well. <laughs> Thank you so much. This has been absolutely fascinating. I love it. Like, this is great. Really appreciate you being here. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah. All right. So, all right, you guys, we're going to about to sign off here. I just want to remind you next Thursday, we'll be going live again, although I won't be the host. We have a special presentation next Thursday with a guest by the name of Neil Patel, who is this, like, if you've never heard of Neil, He's this amazingly knowledgeable guy who knows everything in the world about internet marketing, but he's also been playing around with video. And so he's coming on as a special Restream guest. It's gonna be next Thursday at three o'clock. So you can look for that on the Restream YouTube channel or the Restream channel on Facebook. That's where you can find that. And I will see you guys next time around.